In today's brief khutbah, inshaAllah, I'll be sharing with you some thoughts about a very beautiful ayah of Surah Al-Baqarah. This ayah is a long one and it occurs towards the end of Surah Al-Baqarah. And the ayat of the Qur'an, they are connected to each other. Allah teaches lessons one after the other and they build one on top of the other. So this entire discussion actually begins in one sense 
with Ayatul Kursi, where Allah Azza wa describes His own glory. Thereafter, Allah Azza wa describes how truth and falsehood are separate from each other, and they can never be confused from each other. After that, Allah Azza wa gave us this beautiful expression of how Allah is always going to be there, and has always been there, to aid believers. Allah is the, the protecting friend, who's always accompanying the believers. He pulls them out of all kinds of darknesses into light. So Allah's aid is always there. After Allah makes this point about His aid, Allah gave us two, you can call them examples. So that you can not just think about Allah's help in theory, but you can actually think of a, a, a living example of how Allah helps. So the first example Allah gave was of Ibrahim salam. And when He gave His example, He says, you know, about Ibrahim salam, and He says to Allah, you know, كَيْفَ تُحْيِي الْمَوْتَى how do, you bring the, how do you bring the dead back to life? And Allah Azza wa asked him, Awalam took me, don't you already believe? And then Allah helped him even in the matter of that question, and he showed him how Allah brings the dead back to life. But the second example, which is what this khutbah is about, is again, how does Allah help believers? How does Allah answer the questions and the confusions of believers? How does He do so? Is in this ayah. In order to understand this ayah, first of all, I'll try to offer you a brief translation of at least some parts of the ayah, and then we'll talk a little bit about the historical backdrop. Or give the example of someone like the Or give the example of someone like the person who passed by a town. A qariya, typically in Arabic, Kathiru Sukkan, Ibn Mandur says. Something that has a lot of people, like supposed to, a qariya is supposed to be a place where a lot of people used to live or still live. Okay? So if it's Less populated, it's not called Qariya. If it's very, very populated, then it's called a Qariya. So this is a place where you expect a lot of people would be living there. What that means is the streets are all bunched together. There are no empty lots, houses on top of houses. You know, it's, it's this con con congested city. But he goes there, but he finds instead of it being full of people, وَهِيَ It is turned over on its roofs. And this is also an image in the Qur'an. Let's understand this image. The literal example of a, a town being turned over on its roof, that's not what's being said here. You see, in the Arabic language, the, the, the urush are the top part of the roof of a building. The inside is a ceiling, the top is a roof, right? So this is talking about the top of a building. This nation was destroyed for some reason, maybe because of a war, maybe because of an earthquake. We'll see the reasons a little bit, in a little bit uh, later. But when this nation was destroyed, of course when a nation goes through war or through a natural disaster, there's damage to the buildings. And there's, you know, the infrastructure is damaged, especially if it's so bad that nobody can live there anymore. So nobody's taking care of these buildings. This entire city is abandoned and there's nobody, you know, keeping up. So what happens, the first thing to go is the roof. Because, you know, if you don't take care of the roof and you don't patch the holes in the roof, and water can get in, mold can get in, insects and animals can get in, they can start deteriorating it, and eventually, after many years go by, the roof caves in. The roof actually falls to the ground. And now what you have left are just four walls. But the problem with four walls is, the only reason, one of the reasons the four walls are being held in place is because of the pressure from the roof. Now there's no roof. So these walls are also getting weaker and weaker, and eventually, these walls cave in too, they start falling. But what do they fall on top of? They fall on top of the already fallen roof. So when Allah says the town was turned over on its roofs, one of the, the images that comes from that is a nation, a place, a city, that's been left alone for so long, that even its walls caved in on top of the already caved in roof, suggesting this place has been desolate for maybe a century or more. It's been, nobody's been able to live here. So this person, الَّذِي مَرَّ عَلَىٰ قَرْيَةٌ وَهِيَ خَاوِيَةٌ عَلَىٰ عُلُوشِهَا he looks at it and says, how in the world? And he uses the word anna, as opposed to the word kayfa. The ayah right before, انظروا إلى بلاغة الكلام والالتفاد في الكلام قال سبحانه وتعالى كيف تحيي الموتى He used the word kayfa in the previous ayah. In this ayah he's saying anna. anna يحيي هذه الله بعد موتها And that question was also, Ibrahim also asked about life and death. This person who's walking by the town is also asking about life and death. And he says, how in the world, how is it possible? Anna is used when you're in shock, when you're in amazement, when you are in disbelief and you say how. 
Like you know, if somebody does something bad to you, you say, how could you do this to me? You don't nicely say, how did you do this to me? Well, he says, well, first I stabbed you in the back, and then, you know. It's not a casual question, it's a shock question. So anna is used in shocking circumstances. Anna is also used when you're being sarcastic, or you're in disbelief, you know. Yes, alu ayyana yawmul qiyamah. Ayyana is even a step above that, you know. When? It's like a, the shocking version of, of uh, mata. But in any case, anna yuhyi hadhihi Allah. How in the world is Allah going to ever bring this back to life? In other words, the person who's walking believes Allah gives life after death. He believes that Allah gives life after death. But you know what? We think of life after death only in the sense of the akhirah. In other words, people die here, and then they will be given life again there. Yawm al Then in Jannah, or in Naam, Allahumma ajadna min ashab al Jannah. Right? So that's, that's what the image is in our minds. But this person is asking a different question. This is a believer. We'll learn later on, this is actually Uzair alayhi salam. And he's actually not only asking about Yawm al Qiyamah, he believes in that already. But there's another promise of Allah. There's another promise of Allah. And it doesn't have to do with life and death of a person on this earth. It actually has to do with the lives and deaths of nations, as we will see. He's not talking about a person who's lying there dead. He's talking about an entire nation that died. It's just a dead city. It's just ruins. And he looks at that and says, how can Allah bring this back? This civilization is gone. Their day has passed. This is just ruins. Imagine if you're going to like the Mayan temples or something, or you go to Egypt and you see the ruins of the pharaohs or whatever. Then obviously you're going to say, the, the, the pharaohs are not coming back. That's done. That's ancient history. That's the view he has of the city. You understand? This is the point he's making. فَأَمَاتَهُ اللَّهُ مِئَةَ عَامٍ ثُمَّ بَعْثًا So Allah gave him death for a hundred years. And he raised him back to life. Now he was asking about the death, life and death of a city. And Allah Azza wa Jal gave him, him, himself death for a hundred years. And then he woke him up. لَمْ يَقُلْ ثُمَّ أَحْيَاهُ then he woke him up because as far as Allah is concerned, death is similar to sleep. And it is as easy for Allah to wake you up from death as easy as it is for him to wake you up from sleep. There's no difference to him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. You see in Surah Al-Kahf, when the people of the cave were sleeping, ثُمَّ بَعَثْنَاهُمْ And أَحْيَيْنَاهُمْ بَعَثْنَاهُمْ Because they were sleeping. We woke them up, we raised them, you know. And here you find ثُمَّ بَعَثْنَاهُمْ بَعْدَ الْمَوْتِ you know, this is why even when we go to sleep, we make the dua. Or when we wake up, Alhamdulillah, الذي أحيانا بعدما أماتنا Alhamdulillah, the one who gave us life after he had given us death. Even though, what we're saying is, Alhamdulillah, the one who gave us sleep and is now allowing us to wake up. But we are to remember the, the connection between sleeping and waking up and dying and coming back to life. So Allah raises this man back to life after a hundred years. He asked him, how long were you down? How long were you staying here? He said, I stayed a whole day. No, I think not. One day is too long. Probably part of a day, maybe a couple of hours. In other words, you imagine if you use the word yom, then what you're talking about then is when you when you Allah gave him death, it was morning time. And when he woke him up a hundred years later, it's like afternoon time. So in his head only a couple of hours went by. So Allah says, قَالَ بَلْ لَبِثَّ مِئَةَ عَامٍ No, 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 you stayed here a hundred years. فَانْظُرْ إِلَىٰ طَعَامِكَ وَشَرَابِكَ لَمْ يَتَسَلَّهُ Why don't you look at your food, your food and your drink. He has some bread, some eggs, whatever he has, and some milk. لَمْ يَتَسَلَّهُ It did not age at all. It stayed exactly in place. A hundred years. He was dead, but his food is exactly the same age. And then he says, وَانْظُرْ إِلَىٰ حِمَارِكَ Now look at your mule, your donkey, because he traveled with a donkey. Now the donkey, it's a hundred years, it received a natural death. In other words, it deteriorated, insects ate from its corpse, it's left to just bones, and the bones have decayed also. Half of those bones, you can't even tell where they are anymore because they're scattered. Some ruins, maybe a skull or some bones are lying there. You know, وَانْظُرْ إِلَىٰ حِمَالِكَ وَلِنَجْعَلَكَ آيَةً لِلنَّاسِ We'll come to, this is the heart of the ayah, and we'll come to that again. But I'll tell you now, now look at your mule, look at this donkey, and I'm doing this for many reasons, especially so we can turn you, meaning this man, we can turn you into a sign, a miracle for people. Allah is saying that the donkey is not the miracle, the donkey is not the ayah, this man is going to be the ayah. 
لنجعلك آية للناس كنا نتوقع لنجعله آية للناس so we're going to make that into a sign for people no you are going to be a sign for the people and we'll see how inshallah soon so now وانظر إلى العظام كيف ننشزها ثم نكسوها لحمة look at the bones how are we raising them up and we're dressing them up with flesh in other words this thing is reversed it's, it's, it's experiencing life in reverse order Allah fast rewinds it's death and the bones start coming back together, the flesh starts coming on top of the bones, then the, the skin comes back, and it's the living mule again in front of his eyes. When all of this became absolutely clear to him, which is also key language in the ayah, when it became absolutely clear to him, he said, I know, no doubt about it, that Allah is in complete control over all things. Now this experience, most historians agree, even though there's some disagreement about the Jewish account of Ezra, that this is talking about Uzayd alayhi salam. Some things about Jewish history are important to understand. Surah Al-Baqarah was revealed in Medina, and the, one of the primary audiences of Surah Al-Baqarah was the Yahud of Medina, the Jews of Medina. And they know their history. So when Allah would quote their history, He knew that they already have the background. They know, the, they know, they know, they know a far more detailed version then the Qur'an is offering in very brief but comprehensive language. So we need to get a little bit of a picture of Jewish history here to understand, because those were the Muslims of that time. Basically, a, a short version, a three minute version of hundreds of years of history in a khutbah setting, here, here's how it goes. You have, you know, the victory coming to the Israelites at the hands of Dawud alayhi salam, Sulaiman alayhi salam. And they established this massive, massive khilafah, even the Qur'an alludes to it, Ya Dawudu inna ja'alaka khalifatan fil ard. We're making you a khalifa on the earth. So the Jewish empire, which was the Muslim empire of the time, expands and has, like, it, it became a global phenomenon. But eventually the, the Muslims of that time, which again the Bani Israel, they start fighting each other and break into groups, and they hate each other and call each other kafir and munafiq and sellouts and all of that. It sounds familiar. But anyway, so they did this, and they broke up into two nations. And when they broke up, the enemies, the Babylonians and the Assyrians, they realized these people are too busy fighting each other, this is a good time to attack them. Sounds familiar also. So they got attacked, and they got destroyed, and Jerusalem was actually destroyed. And hundreds of thousands of people that were still alive, even though hundreds of thousands were killed, the hundreds of thousands that were still alive were taken as prisoners into Babylon, which is modern day Iraq. They were taken as prisoners. So Jerusalem was abandoned. It was completely abandoned. Okay. Now when this happens, by the, and they, as a sign of just crushing the morale of the Muslims of the time, because their Kaaba, their Qibla, was Al-Aqsa. And in Al-Aqsa, there was a chest that had the staff of Musa alayhi salam. And some of the uh, artifacts from Harun alayhi salam. You know? As, as, just as a mockery to just poke insult at the Muslims of the time, they destroyed their Kaaba, they destroyed their Qibla, and they took that chest and took it back with them as a trophy. They took it with them. How humiliated and how demoralized the Muslims were of the time. And they're living as slaves, and many, many years go by. Some even say centuries go by. And these people, now they're living under this master's rule in Babylon, and the masters were pagans, you know, they worshipped all kinds of things. They had all kinds of mythologies. But the people of Islam, the people of Bani Israel, they were people of Tawheed. But their religion started getting corrupted. So not only are they living as slaves, now mentally and in their thinking, they've also adopted practices of the mushrikun. They've adopted practices that have nothing to do with Islam. Their thinking about Islam is not as pure as it used to be. And then the Torah itself. We have Quran, they had Torah. The Torah itself is lost. It's lost. They rip up all of the copies. The, you know, the, their owners, and the, the few hufal that were left, they disappear. So Torah is basically gone from these people. So their Islam, their religion has been taken from them, their land has been taken from them, but you can say their identity has been taken from them. And in that context, Allah sends them a Prophet, salam, who is now passing by Jerusalem, which he knows is the capital of Islam at the time. This is the haram of the time. And he looks at this destruction and he says, how in the world is this ummah going to come back? This ummah is done. They're finished. They don't even have their book anymore. They don't have any unity anymore. They're living as slaves. This nation's time is gone. And Allah Azza wa Jal gave him death for a hundred years and rose him back to, to life. In other words, Allah Azza wa Jal is teaching us that just like we believe that Allah controls life and death of one person, 
of one person, Allah controls life and death of an entire nation. He controls the life and death of an entire nation. And so when Allah teaches him this lesson, and he wakes up, and he sees this, he experienced this personally. But his question was, how will the ummah make a comeback? How will the Muslims ever come back to where they're supposed to be? I cannot see it. Politically it's impossible, economically it's impossible, statistically impossible, educationally it's impossible. Look at their situation, it's not getting better every day, it's getting worse every day. So I don't see how this is ever going to happen. Those days are long gone, and Allah taught him this lesson, so when he gets up he says, أَنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَىٰ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ I know now for sure Allah can do everything. In other words, Allah doing everything doesn't just include my life and death, but the entire ummah's life and death. SubhanAllah. This is the lesson he learned. And now look at what, the, what Allah Azza wa said. When he said that I'm gonna raise the donkey, the mule, back to life, he, he paused. There's an intifad in the eye, there's a jumla istiqnafiyah. Wali naj'alaka ayatan nas, So that we can make you a sign for the people. When people meet you, they are going to be reminded of the ayat of Allah. Why? Because a messenger, a prophet, who he was, he was a prophet. And he went, by the way, the history is he went back to Babylon. And he preached to the Muslims. And he actually recollected the Torah. And under his, under his leadership, they fought against the Babylonians and they were able to free Jerusalem once again and populate it once again. That's a brief version of that history. But it all began with that one incident when one person believed by, in Allah, Allah's ability to bring the nation back to life. Someone who holds the mimba, which was the prophets of that time, it was absolutely necessary for them to believe that Allah Azza wa Jal will make things better, no matter how bad they look. No matter how bad they look. I started telling you in the beginning, one of the earlier lessons, that this is a case study of Allahu Waliyu Alladina Amanu Yukhrijuhum Min Albulumati In Al Nur. That is not theory. We're not learning a theoretical ayah when Allah says, Allah is the protecting friend who accompanies the believers and He pulls them out of darknesses into light. Anyone who represents the sunnah of the prophets, not just one, of all the prophets, alayhi salatu wasalam, then he, they have to be optimistic. They have to have a perpetual optimism. They have to believe Allah can bring anything back to life. So our conversations are not supposed to be overwhelmed with the problems. Oh, this is going wrong, this is never gonna get fixed. This is hopeless, this is hopeless, this is hopeless. I've been, you know, I've, alhamdulillah, born in a Muslim family, been around Muslims my entire life, and I can tell you, most of our dinner conversations are about how bad things are. And they begin and end with, there's no hope, and this is only getting worse. Oh, we've seen this before. Ah, oh, there's no hope. No hope, no hope, no hope. And you keep, you keep that up. You keep that up, because you are confirming your disbelief in Allah being capable over all things. You don't even realize it. You think Allah's control over all things has to do with the trees and the sky and the birds, and it doesn't have to do with us. It has to do with us. This is the lesson he's being taught. The Prophet doesn't know that Allah is control, in control over all things. Obviously, Salam knows that Allah gives life to the dead. Salam knows that Allah controls everything. Rasul knows Allah brings people out of darkness into light, but he didn't connect that idea to the current problem. To th these are two separate ideas that are in our head. They're not connected. We have to connect our understanding of reality with the word of Allah. They're not two separate things. You see? We have to see the world through the lens of Allah's words. And then our perspective changes. Then people ask, you know, people ask me wherever, you know, so Brother Nawal, do you have any hope in the Muslims? Do you have any hope? I was like, yeah, of course. And they said, how? How do you have hope? Goes, how do you not? You read Quran, don't you? You know? How do you not have hope? How are you depressed? How are you looking at the seen world, the seen reality, and you are judging what Allah is capable of based on a shahada? He's alimul ghaybi wa shahada. He's the knower of the unseen and the seen. There's an unseen reality at work. There are people that are coming back to Allah in ways we don't even understand. There are people whose hearts are transforming on the outside. You can say there's you know, economic you know, tribulation, political tribulation, social tribulation, educational problem. You can list the problems and they'll never come to an end. For, and let's bring it closer to home. Let's not talk about the global reality of Muslims. I have two minutes left. Let's talk about, let's bring it closer to home. Albany. 
You come here, you talk to some people. So how's the community? Ah, oh, mashallah, we got a lot of problems. <laughs> we don't have anything going on. Nobody told me that, by the way. <laughs> so you're looking at each other, who told me? <laughs> no. You know, we don't know, uh, nothing's going on, there's no activity, we don't have this, we don't have that. You know, it hasn't changed for years. You really, that's the attitude? No wonder things haven't changed. You're supposed to be optimistic. You're supposed to do a little bit, just a little bit, and you, you see what Allah does next. One man who believes, one prophet who believes, he does not have superpowers. He is just there to instill optimism into people. Remember how Allah brought my animal back to life? Allah will bring us back to life, don't worry. He becomes an ayah for the people. He becomes a reminder for the people. He's a source of motivation and rejuvenation for the people. That's what you're supposed to be for the people around you. People around you are not supposed to become more depressed. They're supposed to become more optimistic. That's how, you know, that this is unfortunate reality today. There's this twisted, you know, impression of religion. The more religious a person gets, the more depressing they are. It's depressing to be around them. Where did we get this from? People that get closer and closer to Allah, you want to be around them because there's a happiness to them. There's a tranquility in them. There's a peace in them. There's, there's an optimism in them. That's infectious. It just carries over. That's what's supposed to be the case. This is what we're learning in this remarkable ayah. You know, through, through the stories of the Prophets, Allah Azza wa Jalla has given us remarkable hope. Just absolutely incredible hope. And if you study that history, you realize if you think things are bad for the Muslims now, you ain't seen nothing. But Ismail saw a lot worse. They saw, we never had a time where the Qur'an was lost. We never had that. Can you imagine that calamity? We never had a time where, you know, the, the, even though the, briefly that did occur, but we never had a time when the Qibla is just taken apart for centuries and nobody can go and don't even know what the Qibla is anymore. What Makkah is anymore. We never had that problem. And Allah brought them back from that. From that Allah returned them. Why, why do you and I believe that our corruption is too far gone, the Muslims are beyond hope, you know, oh, the only thing that can happen now is Allah will just replace us with someone else because we're useless. Stop talking like this. If you talk like this, Allah will say, fine, I'll give you what you want. You're asking for it. May Allah Azza wa Jalla make us a people of optimism and especially instill that optimism into the generation that is coming. May Allah Azza wa Jalla make us a people who hold on to the best of this book and are able to deliver its message in a sincere and honest way. الحمد لله وكفى الصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على أفضلهم وخاتم النبيين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين يقول الله عز وجل في كتابه الكريم بعد أن أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد عباد الله رحمة الله اتقوا الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر ولذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون حقم الصلاة إن الصلاة كانت على المؤمنين إذا ونسوه